Good. Hi, Pamela. Thank you for the introduction. I, I got something new to add to my bio now. I'm apparently a star. Is that what a star instructor? <laughs> yes, you're a star that's instructor. Bio. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, no, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for um, inviting us to be a part of this workshop today. And yeah, I just want to say hi to everybody that's connecting. I've heard it seems like people are connecting from all over the um, Caribbean, a couple of people from New York City, a couple of people from Philippines, and I'm sure more are going to be joining. So hello to all of you. And uh, my name is Owen. This is Otto. Otto. Hi, my name is Otto. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're excited to be with you here today. Um, this is for us an exciting opportunity to share uh, a little bit of what we've learned over the years about permaculture. And the way we wanna to try to present today is to keep it as practical as possible. Permaculture is one of those uh, topics where you can just get really out there with a the theory and it's important, the theory is important, but we're gonna to try to really ground it today because it's a short workshop series. I mean, a short workshop. We're gonna to try to keep it really grounded in like practical application of the principles of permaculture, like try to give you some examples of things you can take away and kind of open up the door for you to do more research uh, beyond this workshop and the subject, right? So, um, but yeah, real quick, just to uh, give a little shout out to shout out to Pamela and the World Central Kitchen team. We appreciate so much what you do. Our relationship with World Central Kitchen started a few years ago when we got a grant that helped fund the construction of this warehouse and storage center that we have here or restore a tractor, agriculture supplies, things like that. And that was a huge um, investment in infrastructure. It was really important. Kind of one of those back-end things, right? There's like farming is mostly about growing food, but as any of you that farm know, there's also all these other systems and infrastructure you have to have in place to help support the farm. And uh, those can be big hurdles for beginning farmers like ourselves to overcome. So that, that uh, grant was a huge help for us. And uh, also at the start of the pandemic in March, 2020, we launched an emergency response food distribution program to elders in our area and World Central Kitchen funded the first few months of that program. And uh, since then we've been able to secure other funding and continue it until today. And now we still have that food distribution program. Um, anyways, Jose Andres is also super cool. I've been thinking when I turn 50, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get one of those vests he's got. Like right? if you try to yeah, if we try to wear the vest so now, cool. it's not gonna work. No, you know? I don't think it would. But when if I hit like fifty or sixty, That's if I'm like as cool as Jose Andres or even just like almost as cool as him, I'm gonna get a vest. Hashtag goals. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure collaborating with such an amazing initiative, such as uh, what Playing To It is doing. Um, it's definitely inspirational for everybody, I guess, here in Puerto Rico. And we hope that it also inspires all of our participants. We even have people from the Philippines today. So hopefully they can learn a little bit more about permaculture here in the Caribbean. Amazing. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah, we're very grateful for the collaboration. And, and so today, this um, subject of permaculture, that's what we're going to be speaking about. Let's just start with a basic introduction of permaculture. So permaculture is a multidisciplinary design science. That's it. Multidisciplinary. So it's drawing on surveying, engineering, soil science, hydrology, water management, um, maps development, uh, agriculture, forestry, agroforestry, you know, all these different sciences uh, basically, permaculture gives you a set of, of principles and tools and methodology to kind of bring it all together and really think about how to design um, and then construct in a, an intelligent, thoughtful way food systems, housing systems, in a way that's all interconnected. Another thing that's really cool about permaculture is that you can do it on any scale. So it could be a very small scale. You could take permaculture principles and apply them to an apartment uh, balcony garden or a suburban lot. You can also, like in our case, we have 15 acres at our teaching center. 15 acres, it's, it's kind of hilly. We're about a thousand feet above sea level. We get quite a bit of rain here, about 90 inches of rain a year on average. So we got a lot of water to manage. 15 acres, you know, relatively complex system where we have housing developments, food systems, I mean, sorry, agroforestry systems, uh, intensive vegetable production, campsites, classroom, parking lot, waste management, et cetera. So here, you know, warehouse, all this stuff. So for us, we've used permaculture principles to kind of design the layout of the whole farm, like in which area of the farm is the best place to put the, the housing sector? Where should we develop our intensive agriculture systems? Um, where is a good spot for 
structural bamboo, food forests, things like that. Um, so you can use permaculture on a really small scale. This, I consider this kind of like a medium scale perhaps. And you can even kick it up to like a really large scale. Like, you know, ideally we'd have more scientists in politics, that'd be cool. You know, a little science and politics perhaps. And we could have um, scientists and urban developers could be using principles of permaculture to develop their designs too for regional um, development. So anyways, really cool, really practical. So just wanna invite you, this is just kind of opening the door um, go and study, learn more about it. There's something called a permaculture design certification. Um, there's a lot of good resources out there. One of my favorite teachers is Jeff Lund um, from Australia. He's been working on this for decades. He's got some really cool videos and resources. Jeff Lawton, uh, Lawton spelled W, sorry, L-A-W-T-O-N. So anyways, check it out. Um, today, again, we're gonna try to keep it real grounded and practical. Um, yeah, it, maybe just to say a few things about Plenitude. Um, Plenitude, we're a nonprofit organization based here in Las Marias, Puerto Rico. We've got multiple programs, but it's all about community, sustainability, and service, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what it's all about. And uh, we teach workshops, we interact with children and youth, um, we focus on permaculture, inspired agriculture, um, bioconstruction. Uh, we teach workshops on how to construct with super adobe and uh having a small local impact right so that's kind of another principle in permaculture is start local do what you can do it's a big world a lot of big problems but we can at least be a part of the solution just starting really small and doing whatever's within your reach right and um another thing about plenitude is not just what we do but also we try to think a lot about like how we do it right so it's not just um what you can accomplish but but how you do it. And that's also inspired by, perma by permaculture. There's three ethics in permaculture. That's kind of something cool about it too. It's not just science. It's like science with a little bit of heart with some ethics. So in permaculture, they've teased out, you know, three really basic ethics that pretty much every religion, spirituality, um, indigenous culture has this, these ethics kind of woven into them. So the first one is earth care, right? So caring for the planet, realizing that there's intrinsic value in all of life, right? Birds, wildlife, trees, soil, right? It's not just that these are just resources for us to exploit, the idea is that there's intrinsic value in all of life, right? So earth care, people care is the second ethic. So people care means caring about people and doing your business, doing your farming in such a way um, where you're acknowledging the, the value that people have and trying to treat everybody with respect and dignity. So. What does that look like in farming? You know, it means that you have to think about giving fair um, wages to your workers, um, trying to find ways to give back, et cetera, you know, treat people with dignity. The third ethic in permaculture is um, fair share or share, right? So the idea is everybody's got a little extra something and give it back. We're part of a whole system, right? We don't just live as an island, totally independent. We're, we're benefiting from so many people that have come before us. Uh, we're staying on the shoulders of, of teachers, of farmers, builders, scientists, spiritualists, you know, social movements, so many things that we're benefiting from. And we also need to give back, right? And that can look like making donations, uh, giving excess produce you have to a neighbor, to somebody that need, donating your time, donating skills, knowledge, things like that. It doesn't have to be a big deal, just little acts of love. So anyways, those are kind of the principle of the, uh, sorry, the ethics of permaculture. And those have also inspired our work. And we try to think about how we do things matters too, right? So even if it's something small, if you do it with a lot of love in a very intentional way, it, it feels meaningful. And for us, it's been satisfying and we're, we're grateful to be a part of this. And, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this class right now, they're doing all kinds of cool creative things. So shout out to all you change makers, farmers. It's not easy to farm, right? Farm takes a lot of work, mm -hmm. right? It's a lot of work, especially now with climate change and stuff. Right. A lot of work, but... Um, it's it it's it takes committed people. We need more committed people farming. So shout out to all of you that are farming or part of the food system in some way. We need more people doing this. And uh, anyways, that's kind of the little intro. Um, I guess maybe I'll just say a little bit more about permaculture before we start the tour. Okay, mm -hmm. that's cool. Yep. Okay. okay. So um, as I already said, it's a multidisciplinary design science, right? There's ethics behind it, right? Um, but the main thing you're going to be working with is 
principles of permaculture and there's this concept of zones and sectors too. So um, we've got about 45 minutes of daylight or so, right? So we're gonna keep this part really short, do a tour because we wanna take advantage of this daylight and show you some things here at the farm. And then afterwards about 30, 40 minutes or so, um, we're gonna switch over to a PowerPoint presentation and we've got like a digital sketchbook and stuff. And then we're gonna go a little bit deeper into these principles, right? Um, but just to give you a real quick, quick, quick overview, right? Just so uh, Otto can draw on a few of these points as mm -hmm. he's as he's giving the tour. Um, there's this idea of zones in permaculture. And the thought behind it is that you wanna try to organize things in such a way where they're efficient, right? So say something like, checking on your chickens you know like that's something you got to do twice a day um you wouldn't want that on the farthest side of your farm right you know where you have to walk really far you have to go up some big steep hill mm -hmm. right with your compost buckets and you're like going up this big steep hill with these heavy buckets you know you're going to get frustrated or tired or waste a lot of energy right um so whereas things that you don't really visit very often like we've got some structural bamboo on the farm that we um check on a couple times a year, you know, like four times a year, we'll just go check on it, prune a little bit, maybe once a year harvest. So that can be further away. So we have to kind of drive up, we put that at the top of our watershed. So it's a little further away. You have to kind of drive up a big hill to get to it and stuff. Uh, it's tough to walk there, but that works out because it's not something we're visiting really frequently. So anyways, this idea of zones, um, we'll share about that more, but it has to do with like efficiency. So you want to put things closest to you or really accessible that you're visiting and interacting with really frequently and things further away that you don't have to interact with as often. So zone one would be things that are really close to you. That's like right around your, your, um, your home or right around whatever the center of your operation is, right? Um, and then goes up to zone two, three, four, five, five being the last zone, which is conservation, right? So that's just kind of a quick sketch overview. There's zones and sectors, and then there's also principles and so principles are just kind of like ways to understand things right so one principle is that um, you want to maximize the beneficial interactions between different elements right so you got all these things like okay what are we going to do we need a greenhouse we need compost we need a road we need somewhere to store tools some fruit trees some chickens right mm -hmm. so you got those are like your elements right so then where permaculture design comes in is you start to think like okay well how can we arrange these or put them in such a way where do i put the chickens where do i put the greenhouse where are we gonna put the compost the tool shed the pathway the parking lot like all those kinds of things right mm -hmm. um where should i put the medicinal herbs where should i put the you know the, the jackfruit tree right so those those elements you have like permaculture help inform and help you to kind of decide where uh, to put these different elements in such a way where you maximize the efficiency and the beneficial interaction between elements. So I'm just gonna like stop there because I could keep going. I wanna take advantage of the daylight. I want you to hear from Otto. Otto's super cool guy, young farmer. He's got a degree in agriculture from the University of Puerto Rico. <laughs> That's right. And he's one of these young, talented farmers that cares about the earth. I'm glad to be working with him. So I'm gonna pass it off to him. He's gonna do a tour. And I'll be joining you in like half an hour or so from a laptop to go more into the principles. Sound good? Sounds great. Thank you so much, Owen. Welcome. And we'll gather questions and take, well, how about while during the tour, let's take a set of questions at some point before the tour ends. Mm -hmm. And then later on in the presentation, we'll do like more questions. Perfect. Sounds great. Sweet. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Owen. We'll Thank see you, you later. Ciao. Hi. <laughs> again, my name is Otto. I graduated from agronomy from the University of Puerto Rico at the Maya West Campus. It's on the west side of the island. I worked for a couple of years in a conventional farm. And now recently I started here with Plenitude, um, helping, them with the, helping them with the agriculture and permaculture. So first here, we have our greenhouse, right? We have a greenhouse here for the tropics. How it's useful in the tropics is it rains a lot here and there's a lot of high level of humidity. So the, so the greenhouse helps, first of all, control the humidity on the plants, which helps control certain pests like fungi. It protects the plants from the excessive rain. So let's say the leaves might not suffer from physical damage or dirt won't fall on top of the leaves that we'll have to wash off later and keeps the, the plants a little bit at the healthier and better for consumption, right? It also has a double function. 
things that we studied that we heard in permaculture, things are interconnected or have various uses. So the greenhouse also works as a rainwater harvester. It has that specific form. So the water goes to the sides, to these channels here on the sides, to these gutters, and then the water is collected, right? It has two tubes at the beginning, one for collecting first the dirt and whatever, and that water will be used. It will be, it will be uh, to get rid of later. And then the excess water, the cleaner water will go into a couple of water tanks we have over here. Each tank is around 1,500 gallons. So in total, we have 3,000 gallons. And what's interesting, again, it's interconnected. The water from the water tanks that is harvested from the greenhouse is used to water the plants within the greenhouse. So you see a connection there, how they're both really, really well connected. So we can see over here. So this greenhouse will be what Owen called the zone two. It's something we, vi we visit various times during the week and we have an eye on. And what, what helps them make it a zone two is the access accessibility, well, how accessible it is, right? So as you can see over here, we have a road, we have a paved road and that helps uh, with, with, with cars, with trucks, with getting things in and getting harvest and stuff out, right? And it makes it easy access, easy, reliable access, right? And another part is how centric it is with everything. We have over there what we call the Shalom Center, which is a place where we process the vegetables and our harvest. And it's real nearby, nearby. We harvest everything and then we walk toward the process center. We also have a shed nearby where we keep all of the all of the instruments and the stuff that we use here. So it's not everything's far away, doesn't make anything any more complicated. Also on top of the Shalom Center and also a workshop we have here, we have solar panels, which is a principle, a principle of using the purposeful like technology, right? We use the solar energy to power both places, but it also powers the water pump that is used for the cisterns that is, collects water from the, from the greenhouse, right? So let's go inside the greenhouse so we can see a couple of the harvest of the, of the vegetables, right? And that uh, they have different principles that we can use, right? So if you can pan out sort of and see all of the different plants like within, within the greenhouse, it's a small area, but still it has like five or seven different crops within the area. That's, a, that's kind of a principle of, of the intercropping of having different crops side by side helping each other or keeping a, diver a diversity within the area, trying to invent maybe a monoculture, right? We have another principle here of vertical space of where we're enjoying or utilizing to the maximum this vertical space so we can save on space for other crops and also if they enjoy even more space and more crops from a lower unit of of area, right? This principle can also be used in other in, in other things, not just for crops. You could use it for maybe a passion fruit vine or other vine plants, right? In your house to create shade, to create a fence or for or for privacy. It could use for food, for privacy or for uh, providing shade. So, so that principle of using vertical spaces and vines and things like that is another principle you can use in other places. We have you can see from the technology here, from the idea of again, again, a purposeful, purposeful technology is the irrigation drip system. This is a drip irrigation system. Instead of releasing like a, a lot of water, it releases uh, drops, various drops uh, through a certain amount of time. And that helps conserve water and also distribute it better throughout the soil profile. So a lot isn't lost and it also can go sideways instead of just percolating all the way down if it was too much excess water, right? Um, you can see the beds that we build up here. These beds have been, each new planting, we apply more compost and also more, it used to be um, mulch, but then it degraded, it could decompose so much that it actually became like a fertile type of topsoil. And we've been using it in each application that helps build up the soil. So more organic matter in the, so in the soil helps retain more water, retain more nutrients, provides more nutrients, provides biodiversity in the microflora of the soil, which in turn, everything is interconnected and helps the microflora also helps the availability of certain nutrients in the soil. So everything there is also very connected. Right. Otto, mm -hmm. there's a question in the Q&A. Sure. Um, 
Someone said, I was curious about this greenhouse size and approximate cost for building something of that size. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think Owen Lear can help us with that question, right? Can explain it a bit more. Exactly. He can explain it a bit more. Um, he was here from the way when the very beginning, when the very beginning of the construction of the greenhouse and yeah, he can answer that question mm -hmm. a little bit better for you. Right? Mm -hmm. This was, it was um, funded through a grant opportunities from the USDA mm -hmm. um, and it's currently being used as like an educational hub that was one of the the primary ways that we got the funding is using it as like an educational place for other farmers to come and students to come and see these um, teaching methods and agriculture styles in practice um, yeah that was some of the funding behind it. But yeah, Owen would know more about those details. Uh, there's another question that popped in the chat. Sorry, guys, about the greenhouse. You mentioned that is a greenhouse for the tropics. Could you say more about that? Sure. So you do have greenhouses, for example, mm. for more uh, temperate areas, right? And that's more for creating heat and maintaining it there. But for the tropic, it's a more of a question of controlling humidity within the area. So it rains here a lot. So the rain, a lot of rain can cause maybe physical damage to some leaves, more delicate plants like leafy greens, small leafy greens. It also helps control the humidity on top of the plant. So that also helps uh, control certain pathogens like fungi, less humidity in the air means less uh, suitable environment for, for fungi. And also, the, the excess rain might cause soil particles to jump from the ground right and fall on top of leaves. That could either, that could be a problem for consumption for some people and you have to wash the vegetables before using. This is a more uh, sort of a, also a safer way to cultivate um, mm -hmm. the vegetable. Here in the tropics, it isn't really used for like heat creation or heat conservation within the area, right? Because it's, we have a, a very suitable weather all year, all year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like thinking about the materials on the sides of the, you know, on the side, you normally see like maybe glass. You see maybe other... glass or maybe plastic, something that doesn't allow for maybe the material to breathe a lot, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Here we just have shade cloths and that's sort of to sort of protect the area a little bit more, like as the sun or maybe other animals that might be coming in, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you can see over here, all right, we have various crops here. We have tomato, carrots, green onions, or chives, um, basil. One thing, one thing to notice here, if you can see over here, we have flowers intercropped with the beans. So the flowers here, they don't produce, we don't sell them, they don't produce anything else besides flowers, but we use them to attract pollinators. So how two, how two plants can they help each other. And then the, the beans is a legume, which fixes nitrogen and feeds the flowers and then we'll feed other plants that will be planted there later. All right. Well then we can I think we can go outside so we can show another aspect of the of the of the greenhouse and the area where we're at. Inviting everybody again to use either the question and answer for any questions that might pop up while we do the tour. Uh, feel free to um, use that or the chat as well to continue the conversation. Thank you guys again. This is a, so far an amazing tour. All right. So thank you so much. Here you can see if you can point over to the trees, we have a couple of trees surrounding the area. This helps in a way uh, mostly to protect from the wind. They work as sort of windbreakers, right? And you also have, they also, they're also a part of the maintenance of the area. So we try to keep them at a certain height and a certain uh, width, so they won't produce too much shade, shade for the plants and also won't be as high that could maybe be a possible risk for the greenhouse, for example. So it's how it, you see how everything, different things are sort of kept an eye on, are considered, are planned out, are maintained, are, are taken care of. Here we have this plastic, this reusable weather resistant plastic that's something that we call ground cover. We used it as a way to control um, uh, weeds and other stuff that might grow in the, any undesired plants that might grow in the area. Um, it's very useful for, 
for example, it's a great way for not relying on herbicides or other maybe dangerous methods of getting rid of, of rid of weeds. It's a very passive form. You just put it once and it controls weeds until the end of the harvest. Yes, it is plastic, but it's reusable. It's very weather resistant and you can use it many, 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 many times, right? Here you see also the principle of the flowers planted with the, with the crops. You see different crops, of different kinds. There you have zucchini. Here we have kale. On the other side, we have Swiss chard. And all these different plants planted together. And the only we do, we use compost and the decomposed mulch. And we also do weekly applica foliar applications. So we might have to apply things like organic means like neem oil to control certain pathogens and certain insects. A mixture of organic um, fertilizer made out of concrete. Um, a, another control for fungi and insects made out of yogurt and lactobacillus at the bacteria. Different weekly applications that we use to also help maintain the health of the plants and control a bit of um, the pathogens and pests that might be present um, within the area. Over there, I'm not sure if you can see it very, very well, but we have a little cage and we have a couple of guinea pigs over there. And the guinea pigs are interconnected with the, the, with the whole system. The guinea pigs will eat residues from our harvest, things that couldn't be sold or things that are too damaged to be sold, right? And then they produce their excrement, their poop that can be used as a fertilizer, high in nitrogen for the plants that we that we have here in the in the in the greenhouse and, and through the whole farm. We'll keep walking and down here until we we're now gonna see yeah. our 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 of our seed bank where we where we germinate most of our plants and we have them in an area all together so we can have it all in one place and also keep it keep an eye on them and can we just appreciate how big these kale leaves are without any pesticides chemicals they're like the biggest kale leaves i've ever seen they're so beautiful right thank you <laughs> Those okay. are lovely. We have a question about cabbage. Um, someone is asking if you have any experience growing cabbage. Um, we do. We do plant like the Chinese cabbage, the bok choy. We actually did last season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it. Owen might know a little bit more, but my understanding is that it needs more of like a cooler climate. Um. We had a few successes. Yeah, we, we really did it once last year and we got a few like decent sized heads, but it's also maybe something that's like a little bit more unfamiliar in our area. So that also comes into play of like thinking about crops and vegetables to grow in the context of the place that you live in and the people and the audience that you're like providing food for and making sure that that's interconnected. Like we would love to, yeah sell some more produce of a certain kind but because we know the the audience and what they tend to buy that also affects like patterns in in what we're planting and exactly what shona what shona is saying is is a very important how you have to consider the crops that you want to plant for your area for your climate and for your for, for your geography in a sense so here maybe we have very a clay soil so we have to modify them a little bit with compost and other things to be more suitable for the harvest for uh, a successful planting there are certain crops that maybe we wouldn't plant maybe either because they're not appropriate for here then they don't grow as well and why spend so much time uh, forcing something when we have other crops that will gladly grow very well in this climate and also the market you have to also consider the market where where you're going to grow so if people want to buy those produce and they know those produce and it's something that they're comfortable with and they and they want to enjoy also again the type of soils if you have sandier soils or more loose soils that's way even more appropriate for let's say a root vegetables and 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 crops right uh, crops like that you have to take into consideration your soil your area your geography and your climate for your crops so over here we have our where we germinate our seeds and stuff like that. Like again, you can see this is more of a homemade sort of greenhouse, and it's also something you can do at your at your home. Not as large or as tall. You can you maybe use a couple of posts, a plastic that you buy from the hardware store and stuff like that, and create your own little like uh, seed nursery 
for your own plans. It's something accessible and something everybody everybody can do. It doesn't have to be as big as this. Again, like Owen said, something it's something that can be applied in different areas and different scales. So it can be something way smaller. So over here, I want to show the plants over here. Mm -hmm. That's being germinated over here. We have some basil, we have some tomatoes, we have some chives, and and other crops. Having them in seed trays and preparing and preparing the the soil mixture made out of compost and soil from the area or peat moss really helps first uh, take better care of the plants, making sure that they germinate a little, a little bit better. You can make, if they improve their su success rate by doing this. Also, later on when you're gonna plant them, you can select then the strongest and biggest plants so you can have a more, even more successful um, harvest. And also it makes it a little bit easier to have it all in one place and making sure that, 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 they're, that they're doing well. Other things you can see, I don't know if you can see these like cages we have over here. These cages is something you can also do very easily at your home or buy from somewhere in your neighborhood or hometown that they can that they can make and they help protect certain crops from from animals. Let's say birds, lizards, rats, and it's another simple like mechanical way. It's like simple way that you can do it to protect your 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 crops and your stuff like that. We have something over here that we can show you just a little bit. If you can show sort of this like um mm. ditch, the ditch, right? So this this is an, again another take another principle of, perm of permaculture, taking into consideration your surroundings in your area, right? So we have sort of a a taller part over here, right? A where slope. A slope where water comes pouring down, and then we plant, and then we made a ditch where the water is first collected it stopped there it has an angle so the water drains but a, a short a very small angle at the angle where the water drains out slowly so most of the sediment that comes from the water that came from the top part of the slope is slowly deposited so it's not it isn't lost in the runoff and if they transport it very far away or to another place that's a part of soil conservation of helping the soil stay in one place and not get lost due, due to erosion and also you, you can see sort of a line of, of, the, of this plant that's a little bit dry right now. That's called very, very grass. And that's another great, it has very deep root systems. It can reach around even six feet uh, depth. And that helps in first in retaining the soil. So the slope maintaining its form, right? Making sure it stays there. And it also acts sort of as a water filter in a sense where water comes down, crashes into the plant and the soil sediments and stays, uh, stays there and protects also the area from more soil erosion, right? And so any questions, Any anything from the chat? Yes, we actually do have a question. Uh, we have Jeshka asking, if one didn't want to include plastic in the beddings, what would you suggest as a viable alternative for weed growth sure. control? Sure, you could use leaf litter, you can use hay, you can use mulch and, um, and cuttings from and leaf 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 litter uh, from cuttings from trees and stuff like that. So hay mulch, uh, leaf litter. Mm -hmm. So if you have any other questions about what you can use, I believe you. Um, I've seen even in Plenty Two that you guys use cardboard sometimes for the, at least for the, certain areas that you also don't want anything to grow, such as like the, the roads or, no. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it recently, but I think, yeah, maybe in the past it definitely mm -hmm. has been has been used. It's another gray of recycling material that you have laying around for uh for for first, like you said, weed control and also soil protection. Another I think another principle of permaculture is not leaving soil completely exposed, always having something on top of it to protect it from soil erosion. So hey, anything that would just allow the soil to be covered in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Oh, it's starting to rain here. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you use the grass that you cut? Um, you can use it if it's 
if there's an area not planted, you can use it definitely as thick as you want. If there's if there are crops around, make sure to leave just a little bit of space between the the grass, the recently cut grass, and the like the stem of the plant because a lot of it can can start to decompose and create heat and damage the the plant. So you can use it, but make sure there's a little bit of space between your between uh, between your plants. And if better, it's web, it might be a little bit better if it's decomposed. And if not, using in areas where you're trying to use more where there you have no like crops. Just in so, yeah, case. so the, the the fresh grass could damage your plants. So leaving some space or just letting it dry out first, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, I think we don't have any other open questions. Let me check on the chat. Um, oh, no, I'm wrong. What's the purpose of the clear plastic or tarp? What other tarps can be used? What about net tarp? Is the net tarp like uh, the shade cloth? I think so. I think the, the purpose of the clear plastic, I think the one you have on top, if, if I'm not mistaken. All yes, right. Yeah. The, the clear, the clear plastic is to allow the maximum amount of sunlight to come through, while protecting the area from rain. So if it's the the net cloth, like you mentioned, if it's like a shade cloth, so that adds an amount of shade, which will reduce the photosynthetic activity of certain plants. It will help other plants with, which are more tolerant to shade, but certain plants that we have here, we don't want to increase the number of shade, which might uh, um make them uh um what's the word take longer in order for for the for us to harvest they or they might become something that they might become they might become stretched out right and not and not the plants or the size or the form that we want them for the harvest awesome um there's another question about contacting um any of you so i'm gonna share um your email um via the chat so you guys can I think Owen is going to share that as well eventually in his presentation but um to Carissa uh we hear you they're interested in some sort of collaboration with 22 so that sounds awesome we're already doing some networking here oh, wow. um, so, so Carissa we will be sharing their contact information in a minute perfect thank you all right is Owen here Owen is oh, Owen's here. Yeah, it's starting to rain. It's starting to rain. I'm not sure the sound it will impede the sound quality. No, we still can hear you well. I think Owen is this. Are there other okay. questions for Alto before we transition? There was one open question, Owen, about the greenhouse, about the size and the approximate cost of the building. And they said that you might have more details about that. Okay, great. Yeah, it's uh, 30 by 72 feet. And then we built an extra extension, which is, I think, 30 feet wide by 20 feet. That's where we have the sea trays. And um, the cost of the primary greenhouse was about $15,000. Um, that's a variety that's called like a tropical design, where it's like, it was th like maybe think $3,000 more expensive than a simpler version, but it was worth it. The main feature is in the roof. Um, maybe, I don't know if Shona could pivot and see it, but the roof has like, um, Instead of it being just a, a round uh, roof, there's like a gap that lets hot air escape. Um, so yeah, we were able to get that greenhouse built through a, an incentive from the USDA. The United States Department of Agriculture has a pretty good incentive to help farmers. So we were able to get some help with that. Sweet, thank you for that. And thank you, Otto, again, for the wonderful tour. It was awesome. Great, so um, are we ready to um, continue now? I think so. Great. Okay, one second. Well, let me just pull up my presentation here. Moment here. Once again, inviting everybody who has any last questions about the tour, about anything that you've seen so far. Um, Owen is now going to get into the theory and the nitty gritty of that. So maybe some of those questions might get answered in this portion. Um, yes, I do. We do have a follow up question. Owen, is there shade cloth in the gap that lets hot hair, air escape? What was the question? Sorry about the gap. 
Yeah, I think it was about the, the design that you were mentioning. Is there a shade cloth in the gap that lets hot air escape? There is. Yes, that's right. So it's got kind of, it's basically two roofs. Each roof has plastic on it, but instead of them meeting in the middle, one's a little bit higher than the other. And then that creates a, creates an air gap. And yeah, that has like a screen uh, material there. Awesome. Yeah, got a screen. Thank you, Owen. Okay, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and do screen share here. One sec. Okay, um, Pamela, could you just confirm for me that you can see that there? Yes, we can see it perfectly. All right. Okay, well, Otto, thank you for that tour. And I'm glad that all the participants got to see that because uh, nothing like seeing it live, the real deal. Um, of course, in this presentation, I'm gonna share a number of pictures and I'm gonna do some sketching also, but yeah, there's nothing like walking around seeing something directly. So again, I'm gonna try to, um, you know, permaculture is something, there's a, there's a course that's called a PDC or permaculture design course, and that's offered all over the world, check it out. Uh, there's some really good online courses. I took one uh, with Jeff Lawton. Uh, he's based in Australia. I took a really nice online course with him. I also did another PDC local here in Puerto Rico with the uh, Institute for Permaculture. But check that out. It's a good way to go in deeper. Just want to point out too, one service, a potential service that you could actually offer is people develop a lot of expertise in this area and do consulting. Uh, we get contacted on a regular basis by people that are beginning farmers. Uh, a lot of people now are coming to farming from other career paths. Um, it's a kind of a cool phenomenon. I wasn't raised a farmer. Alto wasn't raised a farmer. Um, Rebecca and Dimer, you know, a lot of uh, the people on our team that work with farming, we weren't raised farmers like on a farm, you know. So uh, these are like skills and knowledge that we've gathered um, as adults. And oftentimes people come from different careers. You know, there's a lot of people here in Puerto Rico uh that are in their 30s and had different career paths and beginning farmers so anyways we get contacted often by people that want consultation site visits um, imagine somebody's thinking about buying a farm and they don't know if it's a good selection or not what's the potential so if any of you you know have experience in farming and you're to get a permaculture design certification and build up expertise in this area you could potentially have a consulting business so just want to share that that's that's kind of an opportunity that's out there and, and a need. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the, the skills are useful even if you don't do business out of it, but I just want to point that out. So the beginning of the presentation, I share this, but just in case anybody arrived late, just want to really quick give a working definition for permaculture. Um, it is, uh, and there's a little bit of Spanglish here, you'll see, definición in Spanish, right? I got a little Spanish mixed in here. This is like a presentation I originally did in Spanish. It's been translated to English. <laughs> um, okay, so basically the working definition is it's a multidisciplinary design system or design science that's based on naturally occurring patterns in ecosystems and it also has a basis, right? It's based on this universal ethic. A um, couple ways of thinking about it also permanent agriculture, permanent culture, right? So we're looking to do things in a really meaningful, thoughtful way. We're drawing on uh, different sciences, soil science, animal husbandry, surveying, map making, etc., and trying to make informed decisions as we develop uh, projects. And again, the scale can be on a small scale or large scale. Um, over the years, uh, people have really taken permaculture in so many different directions and realized that some of these ethics and principles, you can even apply to things like finance and economics or to community governance. So that's pretty cool. You know, it's mostly started off focused on agriculture systems and then that kind of mixed with, okay, well, agriculture access structures, you know, the interface between those. But over time, yeah, it's been really cool to see how um, permaculture has grown a lot and people are able to take some of these same principles and use them in these different areas like finance and economics. So pretty cool, check, check it out. Um, Went over this in the beginning. I'll just breeze through it real quick. But you know, there's this ethics in permaculture. That's something I'm really attracted to. It's not just science, but it's science that's informed with a caring heart, right? So the first ethic is care for the land. The idea that there's intrinsic value in everything 
on life. It's not that this planet's just here for us to exploit, extract everything we can. Um, now, of course, the counterweight to that is that, you know, any of you that have a, a business farming know that you've got to, you know, be efficient and, uh, you know, you can't bring too much sentimentality. It's like, we want to make this an efficient business. It's hard to make a profit farming. Um, but of course, there is a way that you can do that, uh, caring for the earth. And, and that's that's uh, a goal, I think, that we should all have, right? How can we make our, our systems, our farms, our home gardens, our businesses productive? How can we get that bottom line if it's a business, but do it in a way that embraces these ethics, right? Which also includes care for the people. Um, we try to pay employees as much as we can um, financially, but we've also realized there's other ways too. Maybe we don't have funds to give them a $3 raise or a $5 raise, but we can find other ways to support them. So we can share extra harvests with them. So every week we have a harvest share that we offer to um, team members and employees. Um, we can do social events, we make people breakfast sometimes, things like that. It makes people feel more cared for. And then occasionally when we have extra resources, we'll do things like install a rainwater harvesting tank as a gift, or go take a work party to somebody's house and help them, you know, clear a plot of land or plant some fruit trees or build a fence. Um, so anyways, this is a, a good thing. So I don't know if any of you have businesses, but these are just little tricks and things we've uh, learned over time. Nice ways to show people you care about them, right? Um, and of course, giving back to society, especially vulnerable populations like elderly people, uh, children, always good to look for ways to, to give back right? and, and, and give, give back extra resources, time, knowledge. Here on the right, we've got a, a farmer. A lot of people here in Puerto Rico know him, very dear to the organic farming community, Luis Soto, and he's uh, teaching a workshop and sharing information he's gathered from years of experience on how to make different natural uh, soil amendments, etc. So anyways, that's real quick. Um, don't want to spend too much time there. We already talked about that, but let's get into design. So permaculture design, right? We're looking, there's, what are the main characteristics, right? We're looking for systems that maximize the beneficial connections in between it, right? That's a big part of what makes a healthy system. One question, you know, that, that, um, the founder, Bill Mollison, the founder of permaculture asked is, you know, what is it that's going on in a natural ecosystem? How is that working so well? It's so productive and there's nobody weeding. There's nobody going around with a lawnmower or a trimmer. Uh, nobody's fertilizing, right? Nobody fertilizes a forest or a prairie or an estuary. And yet they're very productive ecosystems, right? And so if you, if you study that and see, you know, that what are some of the main elements of the system and the idea is let's try to imitate um, some of those characteristics and patterns in our agriculture systems and get a little bit closer to that right how can we have um, so a few key things are diversity having biodiversity um, for some farm models you know it's not always practical to have 30 different kinds of crops um, for us we have a farm share and people do want a, a decent selection. So we've got chives and lettuce and kale and different kinds of kale and um, cucumbers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Sweet potatoes, um, curcuma, turmeric, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, for us, that's kind of our model is having a selection of different things. But for a lot of farms, it's uh, their model may be to really produce well one or two crops, right? We produce turmeric here or we produce, uh, Sweet plantains, I'm sorry, um, sweet potatoes, etc. So even though, even if your business model is such where you've really focused on one crop, you could still think about the whole system, right? You've got your main crop areas, but you also have perimeter areas, roadways, that little bit of space behind the warehouse, right? Little bits of wasted space in the corners, the edge of the plots. So there's opportunity even in a farm that focuses mostly on one crop to bring in biodiversity, right? So you're gonna have different flowers and to attract pollinators, um, some fruit trees to give a little bit of, you know, harvest for, for the team, uh, you know, have a little bit of extra crops. Uh, you wanna have um, leguminous trees and stuff to produce biomass that you could use in your compost systems, et cetera. So really this diversity is really important to keep things healthy, um, to have, to reduce the, in, the problems we have of pests, 
It also gives you more resilience, right? So if you do have a number of different crops and all of your tomatoes get sick this year because uh, you have an extra humid season, um, you're still going to have other crops that did really well, right? So diversity is really important for so many reasons. Um, another thing, right, that Bill Mollison, the founder of permaculture, was looking at natural systems. He also saw that, you know, everything's circulating through the system, right? A tree log, fall, a tree falls on the ground and it gets decomposed and the bugs and the ants and everything come and break it and spread it around and it, um, the fungus breaks it down. It all gets recycled and turned back into to energy, right? There's no waste. Everything's um, living, nothing lives forever. Things are dying, breaking down, waste systems, and it all gets recycled through. So, you know, we want to really kind of like internalize that and, and try to find ways to um, imitate that in our systems. Okay, at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned zones, right? So let's get into zones a little bit. This is like a really key thing in permaculture that you want to take away with. Very practical, right? So it's a way of organizing your spaces, your projects, your different initiatives, or we use this word in permaculture, elements. You know, elements, we're not talking about earth, fire, water, ether. By elements, we just mean things like a greenhouse, an animal system, a rainwater harvesting tank, a road, a pond, a warehouse, things like that. Those are different elements in our design. So we want to organize those in such a way that maximize the efficiency. And we want to think about things like how often do I need to visit the space? How much maintenance is required? Etc. So it's it's like one layer, one lens with which we want to see the landscape and, and, and see our project. Um, here's a little bit of Espanol again. So we've got zone one on the left going over to zone five. So zone one, you've got things that are closest to your home or the center of activity. You want to have here a, a high density of biodiversity. These are areas that require a lot of maintenance. So um, you know, a home, a small home garden may just have zone one. You know, if you're just in a small urban or suburban plot, it may be that you open your back door and you've got your zone one there and that's it. Or maybe you've got a little zone two in the corner. But on a larger farmer project, you might have um, multiple zones, right? There's, but then again, there's no requirement that you have all five zones in your farm. These are just concepts, like ways to think about things, right? Um, so zone one, it's very intensive. Uh, things that require a lot of maintenance, things that you're using frequently. So a little tip, you know, a little tip if you have a, a home vegetable garden, as close to your kitchen as possible, a nice thing to do is just have a little herb garden, right? A little herb garden. What are things that you use often? You know, imagine you're making um, a little omelet in the morning. And if you can just open your back door and just take a couple steps and harvest some basil or some cilantro, um, you're more likely to go grab it really quick and come back and add it into your meal, right? And if you have to walk out and, 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 you know, take 30, 50 paces to the back corner. So even if you've got your main production a little further away, a nice tip is to have really close to your house, at least a little constructed herb garden or something. You know, it's just a nice, nice little thing to have handy. Um, zone two are um, food systems or animal systems that um, require frequent maintenance, you know, maybe once a week, twice a week, but not as frequent as zone ones, right? So here you might have things like fruit trees that you're harvesting. You might have root crops like sweet potato or turmeric or duca. Um, this might be a good area to have your compost, uh, et cetera. So, you know, chickens, things like that. They're things that you want quite close, but maybe not right on top of your house, right? Like for me, if I were to have chickens, I wouldn't want the chickens right, you know, on top of my back door. You know, I'd rather have a little herb garden right there and maybe a nice, you know, peaceful area to sit down, enjoy the outdoors and have, you know, the, the dust and the noise and the feathers from, from chickens or from a compost pile or from a couple of goats, you know, things like that, a little bit further away from your, from your home or from your business, your center activity, et cetera. So, um, and you can do that because there are things you don't need to visit so frequently. Um, zone three, again, we're getting into things that require less and less frequent uh, visits and maintenance. So, up at the top, bosque de alimentos, right? This is in English, a food forest. So um, real quick, just if you've ever heard of a food forest, put a comment, um, love to hear from you. If any of you know about food forests or have food forests, um, basically the idea is it's a polyculture system. We've got a diversity of fruit trees, like here in the tropics, we've got 
you know, you might have an avocado, some breadfruit, um, perhaps a mulberry bush, coconut palms, uh, things like that. But you can also have other layers, like you could have um, some parches or um, passion fruit vines growing up one of your trees. Uh, so you've kind of got vines in there. You could take advantage of the shade from the trees or, or spread the, the trees out a little bit and have some areas where you have some crops that are down lower, like you might have a, a little forest garden patch where you're growing some, some um, malanga or sweet potatoes or turmeric, etc. cetera. Um, you may have animals mixed in with the system. Animals are really good in food forests, right? So they can, you can have um, sheep or goats helping to clear and maintain the grass. Um, the kind of low level grass where you have fruit trees growing up and producing jackfruits, etc., uh, breadfruits. So food forest. Anyway, super cool thing. Check it out. That's a whole rabbit hole. Um, there's some, once Jeff Lund did this tour, he was in Vietnam and he just like walked around and saw this amazing food forest. Uh, this elderly couple in Vietnam was in this workshop. It was so cool. These guys are like in their nineties, super healthy. And they walked around, they're just like, and he's like, so do you guys do maintenance? And they're like, maintenance? What's maintenance? <laughs> you know, they're like, we just harvest, you know? And they just had so much food in this like half acre behind their house, like all diversity of herbs, roots, vines, fruits, uh, coconuts. And it was all just growing. It looked wild. Like if you didn't know better, you might just think it was like a jungle or just like a crazy overgrown area. But everything in there was edible and useful. And they didn't do any maintenance. They just walked out and harvested stuff. They've been doing it for decades. Really cool examples. So anyways, Food Force, check it out, YouTube it, all kinds of cool things there. Um, anyway, zone three can have things like that. This might be where you put your animal systems, etc. Zone four, these are like long-term cycle projects, things like um, agroforestry. So for us, zone four, we've got structural bamboo. Um, you know, these are things that require minimum amount of irrigation, maintenance. You could be growing wood for firewood or wood for construction. Um, you could have animals mixed in with that, with these systems, right? Or you could have kind of zone three come up on the edge of zone four. So you could have pasture lands with fruit trees and then kind of on the outer edge have like a zone four, right? It's, there's, there's cool, it's cool when you can have interactions between the zones too. Neat things happen where one zone kind of bumps up against the other. That's another principle of permaculture actually is edges, maximize those beneficial interactions that happen on edges, right? If you think about it, some of the most productive, interesting, dynamic areas in a natural landscape happen at an edge where two different um, systems connect, right? So where you have the water and the land meet, right? That edge, extremely productive, extremely productive. Where you have a prairie meets a forest, right? There's all kinds of unique animals and species that take advantage of that that edge, that border. Anyway, so that's just a little thing. Uh, okay, so we're going through zone one, two, three, four. All right, now we're into zone five. Zone five are areas of conservation, areas where you don't do anything, natural areas. Um, so here we have 15 acres at our educational farm and teaching center. We have a couple zone fives in our farm, conservation areas. One we have about 30 feet actually from the home that I'm in. Right now I'm in a super adobe home. Uh, built with dirt. We put dirt inside of bags, compact it, barbed wire, plaster it with clay, super dope. Check it out. So this is zone one. Right over there, we've got a classroom, rainwater harvesting tanks, um, greenhouse, kitchen herbs. It's all right here. So we're in zone one. And right next to zone one, we've got a zone five conservation area because we're pretty close to a river. So about 30 feet over that way, we've got a steep slope that drops down to the river. And so we want a forest buffer to protect that hillside from erosion, or if we get, you know, a hurricane and the river um, waters rise up and the river gets very powerful and flooded, you know, if we were to plant, like that's not a good place for an animal system, for example, like you wouldn't want to put your, your animal systems or intensive vegetable, <laughs> vegetable production on a steep hill going down next to a river, right? That's a good spot for zone five. Um, so yeah. And, and, if you've got a hilly landscape, anywhere that's steep, you really want to go for like zone four, zone five. The more flat, uh, gentle hillsides are better for like zone one, zone two, zone three. Um, anyways, what's the point of a zone five or conservation area? There's lots of benefits of it. One is 
birds, wildlife, bugs, you know, it just helps maintain a healthy ecosystem. These guys kind of important function. They're going to be coming in and serving you. Those birds are going to come in and eat the bugs and your vegetable garden, right? Those bees are going to hide out in the forest. You're going to come and pollinate your crops. So it's really important to have this habitat, this wildlife. Um, it's also, you know, it can be important for preventing erosion or landscape landslides, like on a steep slope. Um, and they are also nice areas just to go and be right. Everybody likes to go be in a forest. And so on a large farm, you know, it might be nice to sometimes have a little area where you can just go and you can have a little path through it. You know, you have a pathway through it, a bench inside the forest. That's really nice. Um, say you've got a little urban garden, I mean, a little suburban landscape. You may have like a little mini zone five in the corner. You know, you can have like a little corner of your yard where you're like, okay, this is kind of like my little mini sanctuary area where you've got a couple trees and you make a little bench and even install like a little fountain. That's kind of like your little mini zone five. Anyways, all these uh, zones, um, don't think about them as like being rigid uh, parameters, you know, like don't waste time thinking like, oh wait, so this chicken's like, is this zone two or zone three? Or it's just a tool, you know, it's a little fluid, right? Just think of it as a spectrum. Zone ones, things used frequently, zone five, conservation. And it's like a spectrum, right? It's a little fluid. So don't, don't get too, too rigid with it. Okay, here's a, a diagram. This is kind of the concept, right? This isn't what it really looks like, right? Life doesn't look like that. Our farm doesn't look like that. I doubt your farm's gonna look like that, right? Life's not, life's a little bit more organic, right? Life's gonna look more like that. But anyways, going back to this, um, it's a concept. So you've got the center of the circle, uh, you've got home or your center of business, and then going out from there further away, you've got zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, right? So that, that's kind of the concept. Um, but life's more diverse. You've got all kinds of things going on. You've got landscape, uh, topography, steep hills, flat areas. Um, there's this giant tree here, like work around the tree. Uh, when we bought the farm, there's this road that came in through here. Um, there's this like obnoxious neighbor over there I don't want to deal with. So that's like, I'm going to pick up, you know, there's all these things you take into account that really shape what your zone map is gonna end up looking like. So it's gonna be a little bit more like this, a little bit more diverse. Okay, so coming back to this idea. So remember as designers, permaculture designers, we're asking ourselves the question, where should I place this element? Where should I put this? Where should I put that? Okay, another thing that we wanna be aware of, so we've already talked about zones. You also wanna think about sectors. So sectors, it's like another one of those permaculture words we use, right? Um, where we talk about the, we're gonna observe what are the predominant characteristics of an area. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples, right? One way to think of it is um, energies um, entering or exiting an area, right? So things aren't just stagnant, things are moving, right? So um, energies entering and exiting an area. So for example, wind, right? Uh, there's a cold wind that comes in or I live co close to the ocean and there's a salty air that blows in from this direction, right? So that's like an energy entering, right? Or, or sunlight, right? This is south facing and the sunlight's coming in through this way, this angle. Um, could be sounds, could be smells, wind, things like that. So energies entering or exiting an area. Um, an example, another example is like a sector exposed to a neighbor with little privacy. So imagine you've got a little backyard garden and over on your west side of the yard, you've got this chain link fence and there's this neighbor over there. Everybody knows, you know, you maybe you got one of these neighbors, they got like uh, garbage, they got like an old, all those like old cars and broken lawnmowers and stuff, or they got this like obnoxious dog that's barking all the time. Maybe you're that neighbor. Just kidding. No, hopefully you're not. Hopefully we're all really smart, clean people and we're nice neighbors, right? Hopefully, but say you've got a neighbor like that, right? So there's energies coming in. There's noises or smells or sights. Okay, and then, so basically what we wanna do is decide, do we wanna block these energies or do we wanna invite them in, right? So in this case, there's a lot of noise and stuff going on there or some ugly sights. I wanna block that. So I'm gonna think about what elements and things I can do to block that energy. Um, on the other hand, a beautiful view right, a beautiful view, or the sunlight I need to grow my vegetables in zone one, right, I wanna bring that light in, 
I want to bring that, I want to preserve that view. So I'm going to open up for that, not, not close or block against it, right? So these are the kinds of things we're thinking about. Other sectors, uh, other examples, a humid sector, an area that's really wet, that gets flooded all the time. Every time it rains, this tends to get really wet and flooded. Or an area with um, big superficial roots. We've got uh, pretty close to the greenhouse you just saw on the tour. We've got a tree called una ceiba, ceiba, beautiful tree. It's about 60 years old. Hopefully it'll live for a couple hundred years. It'll be here beyond us, right? Um, hopefully it'll stay there. And it's a beautiful tree, but it has these root system that's superficial. So that affects, you know, you can't, that's not a good spot for a vegetable garden. That's not a good spot to grow root crops or to try to plant other fruit trees close by or to make a pathway, right? So um, that's an example or an area that's very dry or there's very compacted soil, right? Sometimes in a suburban garden plot, um, you may discover there's an area of your yard where you've got nice fertile soil. There's been trees for years. They've been dropping leaf debris and built up this nice layer of uh, healthy soil. Or you might find that there's an area of your yard that's really compacted or garbage. Sometimes in a suburban plot, you find an area where you keep finding garbage in this area. Okay, so elements, sorry, um, sectors, right? Talking about sectors. These are the kinds of things you want to design, you want to pay attention to, right? Um, wind patterns, etc. Um, so anyways, all these kinds of things we've put into practice designing our 15 acre educational farm and teaching center, right? And so some of the big things in our, in our farm that have jumped out for us, some of the sectors that really jumped out for us is um, topography, right? So areas where we have uh, most of our development are areas that are relatively flat, whereas the steepest areas we've sanctioned more for conservation areas or forestry. Um, access also has been a big thing for us. So there is an existing um, asphalt road that goes there back to where the greenhouse is. Uh, greenhouse actually wasn't built when we took that picture, but it's kind of up there in the middle. And anyways, that played a big factor in developing that whole section. Like, whoa, this, this road is really valuable, you know? We've got other roads that go through the farm, uh, they're dirt roads, and they take a lot of maintenance, a lot of work to keep up with because we get such heavy driving rains. Um, big rain events, all the roads basically turn into streams for a couple hours and they wash away the rocks and the gravel. You know, you, you pay some money, you get some machine to come in and spread some rocks and you think, oh great, the road's really good. A couple rainy seasons, it gets washed out. Anyways, there's techniques to minimize that, like things like rolling dips, channeling the water, trying to divert water away from the roads as much as possible tilting your road a little bit, doing speed bumps to get the water off the road, breaking up into a bunch of small watersheds, right? Breaking the road up into lots of small sections so the water doesn't get a chance to accumulate, to build up speed, velocity, which is what really causes the erosion. Anyways, there's techniques to, to reduce um, erosion on roads, but point is they're always gonna take a lot of work. They can be rough on your car. Uh, so areas that we have asphalt roads. If you've got asphalt or like concrete roads, Good for you. Take advantage. Just remember, there's other people out there that don't have those roads. So <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate what you got. Um, anyways, all these sectors. So we've got like a, a windy sector. We've got a kind of towards the center of the farm there, an area that tends to flood uh, during the rain. It's kind of the bottom of the bowl, right? We've got this big watershed, that 15 acre watershed, and down towards the bottom, closer to the river. All the water gathers there and it tends to flood. So that's kind of affected what we're going to develop there. Anyways, um, you mentioned the Saba tree, right? This beautiful Saba tree that has these roots. That's that actually defined where we put our greenhouse. Like the, we basically, that was kind of like a main mark point. Okay, so this tree is here. Nobody's going to touch that tree, right? Beautiful Saba tree. Let's count out about 30, 40 feet away from the tree. Give it space to grow over the next few decades. And now we'll start a greenhouse here and put it going that way. You know, that, that's a good way to think about things, you know. Now, I'm a tree hugger, some of you are probably tree huggers, but there's trees and then there's trees, you know, like I would not redesign the whole layout of a greenhouse and things like that just for like a normal weedy leguminous tree, right? Or, uh, you know, just kind of like a certain trees, you know, they're a little bit 
they still have value, but a little bit more ordinary or dispensable. You know, you could cut them down if you need to to develop. That's practical. Okay, that's agriculture. That's human development. You got to cut things down sometimes. You got to clear. You got to make a little bit of an impact. But you want to do it in a really smart and intelligent way. And especially some of these like really um, historic trees or um, native trees that have been growing for decades, you really want to see as much as you can how to preserve them and work your design around it. It's worth it. Okay, so anyways, I'm throwing a little bits of stuff here and there along the way, but basic progression of the curriculum so far, right? Going back, right? So we did a definition of permaculture. Everybody knows that. Talked about zones. Everybody's got a sense of that. Zone one to zone five. Talked a little bit about sectors now. So we've got these different you know, roots, uh, dry, compacted, wet, flooding, nice neighbors, good views, ugly things we want to block, etc. So these are sectors, right? Zones, sectors. Okay, let's keep going. Now let's get a little bit more in, into some of the principles and design, right? So designs, you know, they're kind of made up of two elements. There's aesthetics, aesthetics, and functionality. Permaculture, we're especially interested in functionality. Aesthetics matters too. We want it to look pretty and attractive and organized, but our number one priority is we want functional systems. Make it functional. Like rainwater harvesting tanks, for example, I think they're beautiful. I don't care where you put a water tank. You can put it, like in our classroom, we've got a 2,000 gallon rainwater harvesting tank right next to the classroom. We didn't hide it. We didn't say, oh, let's put that, tuck that away in the back. That's ugly. It's plastic. No, it's beautiful. I see a 2,000 gallon rainwater harvesting tank, and I think water security. I think next time hurricane come, we're going to have water. I'm thinking every time it rains, we just gathered another 2,000 gallons of water and pumped it on our crops and saved our water bill and recycled, you know. Anyways, functionality, right? That's, you know, I'm sure a lot of you can relate, right? There's, you want to have things clean and orderly. That's nice. Farm should look beautiful um, and productive. But the real essence is it's focused on functionality. In functional designs, they should be sustainable as much as possible, right? We want to provide for our own needs. Everybody knows that's done any serious farming. You can do as much as you can to recycle things on site, right? You can have animals eating grass and turning that into manure and you can mix the manure with the food scraps and you can um, have some leguminous trees that you're growing and pass them through a chipper and mix all that together and make some beautiful compost. Um, and so that's kind of like recycling nutrients within your system and giving them back to your productive crops, right? So th this that's an example of a sustainable um, system. But, you know, I would say do that as much as you can. But often in a real productive farm, you may not have the, the people power, the personnel or the capacity to do all of your own composting. You may need to outsource that and buy your compost from another business or person that provides that service in your, in your region. And, and in a sense, that's also sustainable because you're recycling nutrients around within your region. It's just not right there from your farm. But at least the, the gold standard, right, is as much as possible, the gold standard is you wanna be thinking about how to bring nutrients from site, right? From right there on your site use it so efficiently and recycle the nutrients that you're not having to bring in um, products and, and things like that. And if you do bring in products, then try to you get um, products that have, uh, that are from your region when possible, like compost, things like that. Um, I know some farms that are really, really productive and they buy these like liquid fertilizers and stuff. I respect that. It's okay. It's okay. You know, I think it would be, more dynamic or more sustainable if they made their own liquid fertilizers on site. But I get it, you know, sometimes like you're managing all business, you've got 60, 100 farm shares, six employees, it's a lot to keep up with, and they may not have the capacity or the bandwidth to be also making all their own um, liquid fertilizers and compost and stuff. And so they have to buy some of these products. And so I just say as much as possible, do it local and, and when needed, you know, it's, it's okay. I think everybody's kind of got to find where they're comfortable on that spectrum and what's practical. Okay, another key thing in permaculture, and this has kind of been implied, I just haven't straight up said it yet, is that it's extremely important um, to really invest a lot of time and effort in observation. Um, it's even said in permaculture that you could 
invest as much as 100 hours in research and you know, observation for every one hour of implementation. I, that, that's a lot, but you know, the idea is it's really important. You know, it's really important, especially with big things. When it comes to like big investments, like where are we gonna put this greenhouse? This is a $15,000 greenhouse. We wanna maximize this investment. Where are we gonna put it? That's something you really wanna take your time and think about carefully. Um, where am I gonna, you know, plant this uh, coconut palm? You know, you wanna try to think about that, but that's, you know, I, I want coconut palms all over the place, really, but you, can, you may not have to think about that quite as much or where to put this vegetable, right? So things that are more permanent and big investments, um, you really wanna be extra careful and think about that, or big, big decisions like zoning decisions, right? Or, or roads, where are we gonna carve this road to this farm? Or where are we gonna put our warehouse and greenhouse? Like those are like big structural decisions that are gonna have like ramifications for years. So those things you really wanna take your time and think about it and work those des designs. Uh, it can be helpful sometimes too to bring in a totally different set of eyes, right? So you've kind of developed your idea and what you think makes sense. Get your partner, get a friend, get a, another permaculture designer to just swing by and take a look and say, hey, this is what I've come up with so far. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Like, am I missing something? What do you think? That's important, you know. Um, anyway, so let's see. What, what did I miss anything here? Okay, yeah, anyway, this, this includes research and investigation, right? Observation includes research and investigation. It also means observing your property different, during different seasons, right? So during a, have you ever seen your property during a really dry year or during a, a heavy tropical storm or hurricane? How did, how did the land respond to that? Um, give me one moment. I'm going to close my door in the window. It's starting to rain. It's making a lot of noise. Be right back. So once again, inviting everybody, uh, if you have any questions so far about the presentation, feel free to use either the chat or the question and answer button. Actually, we were hearing the ring all the way here. Owen. Hey, I'm, I'm back. Hold on. Um, I didn't hear what you shared. Did I, did I need to hear what you said? No, it, I said that we, I, I, you can actually hear the rain at the bottom. So it seems to be raining pretty heavily out there. Yeah, yeah, it's raining. Yeah, so we've got to, yeah. So should I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. I'm going to go, so we're going to go through this theory a little bit longer. Then I'm going to do a sketch and then take some questions. How's that sound? Awesome. Great, thanks for your attention, everybody. Thanks for sticking with me. I'm just sitting here talking to a computer screen right now. I hope this is interesting and relevant. There's real people out there. Hi, people. I'm just seeing a computer screen, <laughs> but I'm trusting there's real people. I know people. the feeling. I know the feeling, don't worry. <laughs> Are there people out there still, Pamela? Yeah, there's 30 something of them in there still. Let's see, yeah, yeah. All right, what's up guys? Oh, say yeah. hi in the chat, let us know. You can get lonely sometimes. I understand Owen in these, in these yeah. sessions. You know, two years ago, I never used Zoom. Now we teach all these Zoom workshops and been kind of used to it. But yeah, it is still a little bit weird. You know, you're just talking from this computer screen. So I understand. I can like real, real life live interaction. <laughs> It's cool. It's pretty neat too. It connects, you know, we got people from all over the Caribbean here tuning in. So, okay. So to continue emphasis on observation, take your time, especially with big design decisions, right? Where are we going to put this greenhouse? Where are we going to carve the road? Smaller decisions, things that are easily reversible. Okay. Plant this vegetable crop here for a season. Didn't work out so well. I'm going to try a different spot. That's cool. That's testing observation. Oh, so I was talking about seasons. Yeah. Look at your farm during different seasons. Especially, you know, rain and dry cycles, wind, how does the wind affect your property? And sunlight, right? Sunlight. So everybody knows the sun moves from east to west in the sky. Well, it's not actually moving. We're moving on the planet Earth, but it looks like it's going east to west. Let's just pretend it's really going east to west. Um, but during different seasons of the year, um, in which hemisphere it is and the angle changes. So I think everybody on this call, we're probably all north of the equator. So the winter for us, right, right, right now, December, January during this time period 
the sun is um, lower in the southern hemisphere. So it's still going east to west, but it's lower angle. Um, and so there may be bushes or trees that during the summer didn't create any shade. Sun angle is coming right over it. Okay, but once you get into these winter months, the sun's at a lower angle in the southern hemisphere, and you may get shade on an area. So just imagine, you've got your whole, all your vegetable gardens set up, you've got a tree line a little bit to the south. You check it out in the summer, everything looks good. You plant it all up, you're, and you're one season in, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, all these trees in the southern hemisphere are creating shade. There's a problem. Now you got to go cut down a bunch of trees, and that's not good. Or you got to prune them, right? So um, anyway, sun angle is something really, really important to be aware of. Um, and you know, just to kind of continue that, in case anybody doesn't understand how that works, in the summer, uh, it's still going east to east to west, but it comes uh, more directly overhead, and then it'll start going a little bit into the northern hemisphere. Right? That's for all of us. They're north of the equator. If you're south of the equator, it's opposite. And this effect of the sun going lower and lower into the southern hemisphere is more dramatically, it's more dramatic or more um, easily observable um, the further you get away from the equator, right? So all of us that are kind of in the Caribbean, we notice it, but it's not so dramatic. Our days get a little bit shorter in the winter and the sun goes a little bit in the southern hemisphere, but it's not as dramatic or as noticeable as somebody who's in, for example, Maine or New York or New Jersey, et cetera. They're much further away from the equator, so it's more dramatic. Anyways, observation, observation. Um, patterns too, right? So this is kind of a neat, cool thing that uh, people get into. You know, nature is extremely efficient, and so you can observe patterns that happen in nature and try to imitate them, like a tree pattern is the same as what we're seeing here um, in a river, right? It's like watershed. Uh, the one on the right, that, that black and white image, that's like a topographical image of um, creek uh, patterns turning into larger and larger rivers. You know, so you can think about um, with your pathways, for example, you know, you've got like the big trunk of the tree, those could be like your main pathways. You know, most people, you know, vehicles are going back and forth down this main strip. But then you've kind of got your smaller paths branching off, you know, okay, this is a road that we use less often. And then within crop crop areas, you have you know footpaths that are only accessible by wheelbarrow. So those would be kind of like more like the twigs. So anyways, you can think about how to kind of like organize those in a way that's efficient because nature is very efficient. Nature can't afford to waste energy. Here's another cool pattern, you know, circles, spirals, or concentric circles, things like that. These are other patterns you see in nature. So you can have like you know your center of your activity going further out. Etc. Okay, that's that's all I'm going to get into as far as patterns. Uh, check it out if you're interested. It's a whole thing. Some people really get excited about it. I find it useful just to know that it's cool to imitate nature, but at least on the spectrum, like within permaculture, I'm a little bit more practical. Patterns are practical, but I, I just have found so much like it's really all about topography and stuff like that. But it's a cool thing in permaculture, check it out. Um, Okay, now I'm just gonna go through really quick a series of goals for design. Let's see, it's 6.30, right? 6.30, cool, okay. I'm gonna take another few more minutes here with theory. So what are some of the goals of our design in permaculture? We wanna increase fertility and reduce soil erosion, right? So um, it means you wanna cover the soil as much as possible. So here you can see, we just built these new garden beds. We added compost, we tilled it in. What's the first thing we're gonna do? We gotta protect this soil from erosion, right? Protect the soil fertility. So mulch, you can see we've got, um, that looks like ordinary grass at first glance, but that's actually cut vetiver or patchouli, uh, which is a plant we use to um, prevent erosion. It has a really deep root system. If you live in an area with um, hills or if you have problems with erosion, look it up. It's called vetiver, V-E-T-I, DER, it's a type of a grass, but it's not an ordinary grass. It's clumping grass with extremely deep, strong roots. And it's in a resistant plant. It does well um, in drought or with a lot of rain, uh, grows well in relatively poor soils. And it's a clumping grass. So you can plant it on contour and it'll just get wider over time, but it's not gonna start running and spreading out like another grass. Anyways, you can also, not only does it help um, 
anchor your, your landscape. We use them on the edges of our terraces, but you can also periodically cut the tops and use it like a mulch and there's no seeds in it. You know, earlier somebody asked about grass seeds. Well, vetiver, I'm sorry about grass mulch. Vetiver um, cuttings are great for mulch because they don't have any seeds in them. Anyways, that's a really important thing. You wanna, like this image right here, this is only like this for a couple hours. By the end of this day, we need to cover that soil. When you've got exposed soil, um, it starts to dry out more quickly in the sun. That affects the, the biology of the soil, right? The microorganisms either die or all the microorganisms and large organisms like worms and stuff go deeper, deeper down. It gets dried out, less, less life, um, less efficient use of water. So mulch um, helps with that, right? Mulch keeps the ground humid and moist and, and um, encourages active soil biology. Um, if you haven't studied much soil biology, it's an amazing thing to look into. Um, it's compost and healthy organic soils. It's more than just not chemicals, right? It's not just not chemicals. It's also compost isn't just supplying nutrients, right? There's a point in the 60s and 70s when um, synthetic fertilizers became kind of the norm. And at that point, they didn't really appreciate uh, the intricacies or they weren't really thinking about the intricacies of soil life and the way that um, microorganisms, nematodes, bacteria, protozoa, and also um, fungi work together to break down and recycle nutrients in the soil and supply nutrients to plants. So plants form symbiotic relationships with these microorganisms. And when you have really healthy biologically active soil, you have less pests, less problem with diseases like nematodes and pests, um, better recycling of nutrients, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of advantage in doing this. And compost is kind of your number one tool in there, but there's all kinds of other cool things you can do like aerated compost tea. You can take a small amount of compost, add it to water, preferably rainwater, and oxygenate it. And, um, and add a little bit of uh, molasses, which is like a food. And what you do is you take the populations of microorganisms that were in your compost, you give them water, air, right? You're bubbling, oxygenating it with a bubbler and you give them a food source, right? Uh, molasses and boom, the populations multiply and in a 24 hour cycle. And then you go and you take that liquid and you spread it all over the place. And you're like populating your soil with beneficial microorganisms. So this can be a good way to jumpstart um, the biological activity in a soil, especially soils that have been mistreated for a long period of time or for maintenance, right? So aerated compost tea, ACT, check it out. There's all kinds of other things that um, practices that help uh, maintain soil fertility and increase the activity of microorganisms. Check it out, get into it. It's really, really helpful. Here's a, a student from the University of Puerto Rico applying a aerated compost tea. So you can see the tank there, it's kind of that brown water. That was like a tea we made in like 24 hours and we're spraying it on the leaves and the soil and the mulch everywhere. And you're just, you can't see it, it's invisible, but you're, well, you can see if you use a microscope, right? It's not visible. You can get a microscope on it and see what's going on, but you're gonna see it's filled with microorganisms and you're just populating, you're parachuting them in and populating soils. Okay, what are other goals of a design? We also want to reduce waste. Yeah, oh, sorry, wasted space, right? So pathways, check out keyhole gardens, kind of cool design concept. So it's like a, like a round circle with an entrance and you come in, it's just like a circle. So from one really small um, entrance, you have access to all the beds. Most of you probably know this, but garden beds, you know, you want to usually keep them no more than four feet wide, three to four feet wide is a good, uh, size for garden bed. If you make your garden beds too wide, then you end up having to step on them uh, in order to harvest or do maintenance and that creates soil compaction. So you want to always avoid walking on top of garden beds, keep it real loose pathways. Anyway, so this is another goal, goal of design is reduce wasted space. Here's a kind of cool pattern. It's like a, a series of keyholes. So, you know, imagine from one entrance you go in, you've got access to that whole U coming from the other side, oh, cool thing. 
Okay, anyways, those are just a few design principles I was highlighting, especially trying to focus on things that are really practical for farmers, soil fertility, reduced wasted space, et cetera. Um, now let's just kind of tease out a few of the most famous, um, useful principles of permaculture, right? So one of them is that every element should have multiple functions. Every element should have multiple functions. Like these tomatoes, they're also making art. That's kind of a joke, but that's not a really good example. Um, okay, the conejo, how do you say conejo? The rabbit, el conejito, this little rabbit we've got has multiple functions. So she's producing manure, she's um, weeding. So we prepare like a garden plot, we put her cage on top of it. She eats all the weeds, she tills it, she gets it all ready, she fertilizes it, and then we move it on to another area. So she's doing multiple functions, right? Um, or, you know, you saw earlier in the example with Otto, he shared with you the example of um, the greenhouse, how it's, it's protecting the plants from excessive rain. It also provides a, a rain catchment area for the tank. Um, it's also a structure that we can use as a trellis so we can build up um, vines and things coming off the structure, uh, things like that. So you wanna try to like have multiple elements, sorry, multiple functions for every element. Okay, another um, really useful principle is we want to just maximize the beneficial connections and inter interactions between elements. We also mentioned that one in the tour, right? So um, an example is, okay, you can have zone four meets zone three. So imagine you have cattle or goats in zone three, and they're clearing a food forest area. They're also giving you milk. Uh, they're, they're doing maintenance in a food forest area. You've got fruit trees like jackfruit or coconut palms and stuff there, and they're cleaning all the grass in between. And then right next to it, you've got zone four where we're growing structural bamboo. You know, we can occasionally cut some of that bamboo and let it fall into zone three, and the animals will come up and eat all the leaves off of it, have a little party, get excited about all the leaves, strip it down for us, and then we can come and clean it up and, and uh, process it for, for timber. So it's kind of like an example, like an interaction between two zones, two elements. Animals to, yeah, animals clearing, manure, etc. Another principle of permaculture, the problem is the solution. You've got a problem, try to think of it as an opportunity. Here, one of our challenges, right, or sometimes it feels like a problem, we get a lot of rain and it rains really hard. It, causes erosion in our lands and our um, roads, it makes roads difficult to keep up with, makes it hard to work for several hours, et cetera. Let's try to turn that into a solution, right? So one thing we do is, well, let's capture that water. Um, there's systems called swales and berms. That's what's on the photo on the right, where there's the fence there. That's a big, long contour ditch, right? A swale is something that's really cool and developed a lot in permaculture systems. Um, it's basically a ditch that's on contour, it's level, and so as water is running down the landscape, it hits this ditch and spreads out, and then it slowly soaks into the landscape. You take the dirt that you remove from the ditch and you pile it up downhill, and so it's loose, kind of loose dirt. You can plant fruit trees in there, that's called the berm, and then the water slowly soaks in. So, and, and then on the left here, we've got an infiltration pond. So both of these water features just flood and they have water for about 24 hours after heavy rain and then it all gets soaked up into the landscape. And um, fruit trees are extremely productive next to swales. Um, it's like a passive irrigation system. You know, let's say it rains really hard today and doesn't rain for a week. How long does it take, you know, a question you can ask yourself is how long does it take for the soil to dry out again? How much of that water got soaked into my landscape and how much of that water just went right across the top and went to the neighbor's property or went to the river. So in permaculture, right, we want to try to capture that water and soak it into the landscape as much as possible. So contour swales, ditches, infiltration ponds, banana circles, look that up. Banana basins and circles, super cool thing to do. Uh, you dig out a little pit, put bananas in the circle, check it out. Anyway, these are ways mulch, right? Mulch, having a lot of trees, having crops, um, having buffer strips, 
All these things help to soak water into your landscape and make for a really productive system. Okay, another permaculture principle is we want to try to work with nature instead of against it. I'm going to give you an example of crop selection, right? Earlier, somebody asked about cabbage. I'm sure we could probably pull it off. If you really wanted to grow some good cabbage, we could do it. We've grown some cabbage, but it was giving us a lot of work. It's not cold enough here. It's always getting sick. And there's other crops that are similar. They're a lot easier to grow, like bok choy has been a breeze. Um, you know, there's certain kinds of kale that are so much easier than other kinds of kale. Turmeric's been a breeze for us. We can grow turmeric so easily. Certain kinds of basil uh, with an eggplant. There are certain varieties of eggplants that do really well, very hardy, resistant to, to um, disease and rot and stuff, pests. Um, you know, if, if there's certain crops that you really like and you're having a hard time growing with them, you know, consider just doing it on a really small scale for personal consumption. But if you want to really produce a lot of food, I think that this is a mandate that we all have, right? This day and age, we need to grow a lot of food. And uh, so there's sometimes work to be done. There's a lot of crops that grow really well in the tropics in Asia that we don't really know about, but that's like a, a, a discussion, right? There's actually a cool book called Oro Verde and, and called... Um, uh, green gold, right? Anyways, he, the author Sadhu, uh, proposes, pushes for this point that we need to bring in more uh, crops from Asia that grow really well in our tropics. They're like a breeze to, but um, to to grow, but people don't know them here. There's not much of a market for it. So, anyways, that's that's something to continue to do. That's a good project that we can all kind of participate in. Is how to keep educating the public and get people more used to eating local crops and not something that grows well in Canada or New England, right? We're in, we're in the Caribbean here. We should be growing things that grow well here. So anyways, that's a little topic. Um, kind of getting close to the end of this uh, theoretical aspect, but I uh, just want to show you this like a clip of a uh, food forest and production area we have in our farm. So remember I mentioned biodiversity. Uh, so you can see straight there in front, some young papaya trees. We've got um, squat, like a pumpkin squash growing across the ground and covering the, the, the landscape and producing on the, on the hillside. This is like a terrace system we have. So it's like um, we carved out these um, steps coming down the hillside. We picked an area that was southeast facing, so it had really good light and it had a gentle slope. And we got in a, um, a backhoe, a larger digger, and we carved out these big terraces. They're 20 feet wide and I think most of them are around 300 feet long or so. And, uh, and then on the slopes, we have tree systems. We have a row of vetiver grass. You can see in the background there behind the, the planted crops, that grass there that's holding in the landscape. And then spread out here and there, we've got shade trees, uh, which we use to produce biomass. We chip it up for a compost, creates a little bit of a windbreak, right? It helps to buffer some of the rain or some of the really intense heat from midday sun. Um, and so anyways, we'll talk about multiple uses, uh, functions for one element, like those trees, right? I just named like three of them, windbreak, partial shade. Uh, we can get wood stakes out of there for fencing, for tools, for temporary um, trellis structures. We can chip it up and use it as uh, biomass and compost. Uh, there's a lot of trees that grow quickly and easily. You can use it as fodder to feed animals. So trees, you gotta make friends with trees. Um, anyway, so just describing a little bit more the elements of the system. So in the flat area of the terrace, that's where we do our intensive garden beds. And you can see there's some young vegetables growing up. And within those beds, we'll probably just have one crop planted. Right? We'll have like all bok choy in this section, all kale in this section. Goes back to the point I was sharing about biodiversity. Sometimes people that are inspired by permaculture, I see that they get a little carried away with the biodiversity. They want to have every single garden bed. It's got like six different kinds of vegetables in it. That makes sense for a really small vegetable garden by your home where you want to have a little bit of everything, but on a bigger commercial scale, it's often going to make sense to have an entire garden bed planted with one or two vegetables. But you get your biodiversity from the whole system. So you've seen this picture, you're seeing fruit trees, papayas, coconut palms, bananas, plantains, vetiver, squash, bok choy, but within those beds, all three of those beds might be bok choy and kale, bok choy and kale, for example, or eggplants and kale. Um, anyway, so that's just a little thing. I, I, I'm trying to share things that are useful. I've just seen it's like, 
really easy to get a lot too carried away with the biodiversity. Okay, so I think that that's a good uh, stopping point. I'm gonna switch and do a little sketch here. Uh, quick sketch and then take some pictures. Here's another picture of our, of our um, terrace gardens. And uh, the one here on the right, we're spraying around hay. That was just after we um, created that terrace with a, with a digger, a backhoe, right? 20 feet wide, about 300 feet long. And then right afterwards, we're ready, right? Soil erosion, we wanna minimize soil erosion. We wanna increase fertility. Right away, we had a bunch of hay and uh, ready to go. We had seeds for fast growing ground covers. We had our grasses ready, the bed of your grass. And right away, we came in with the team. We mulched everything with hay planted it up because you don't want things to stay bare for a long time. Okay, so I'm gonna um, switch over real quick. Starting to run out of time, um, but just do, I'll keep this short and sweet. I'm gonna do a little sketch here. Okay, so this is a um, little sketch here I'm gonna show you. So I just wanna kinda, a lot of what I've been sharing about is on a bigger, scale uh, like 15 acre larger farms and stuff but I want to share with you a few things just for like a household real quick examples just to kind of wrap it up so imagine this black line here is um, the fence for a small suburban plot and this box here is a house and a garage right so I'm putting here hey, hey, hey. okay hold up this is a little little slow here oh okay there's like a delay big delay okay maybe i'm running to my programs anybody wants to buy me a new computer i need a new computer just kidding no for real though anybody's got okay oh boy this is a serious delay Gasa. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna try to make this work. Okay, so here's the home. Here's our yard. So starts with observation, sector analysis. Okay, so let's say over here on the right, over here on this side, we've got some kind of uh, obnoxious neighbors, right? And so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. This is this delay is so bad. Pamela, I think I might just need to skip this activity. It's like a really bad delay. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going no on. No worries. The technical challenges are so real in these times. Uh, so I, we fully understand. Yeah. I know it was very interactive to see you kind of putting all the elements um, in place, such as you were saying. Yeah, I wanted to kind of bring to light a little bit. Well, I'll just talk through really quickly without sketching, but. You know, looking at a house like this, say you've got some neighbors on one side, and you want to kind of block that view a little bit. You could plant some bushes or things like that to kind of block the view. Um, you know, if you're vegetable gardens, you want to really think about light. Um, you want to usually put vegetable gardens on the south or the southeast side of your home. Um, you know, you want to think about where to put a rainwater harvesting tank, et cetera, banana circles, 